Hello everyone, and welcome to Once to Mondays, where I'll be reading 100 classic books in just a few moments. For right now, I'm going to let people know that I'm streaming, and I'll be right back. Good old fashioned reading is coming your way. How about I get the show started today? Hey!
Alright. I'm not going to go ahead and keep doing that voice while I'm doing the tr introduction. That'll be for a special character in the story. I think you know who. Um, but for right now, let's go ahead and get into Dracula. Uh, before we do, let's go ahead and get into about the author. Bram Stoker. Bram, Bram Stoker was born in Ireland in 1847, the third of seven children. His childhood was bright, blighted by an illness which, though eventually cured, kept him be bedridden until the age of seven. He went on to study mathematics. At university, College Dublin, but it was the theater that really captured his imagination. After graduating, he worked in the civil service in Dublin, writing and publishing short stories and theater reviews. In his spare time, he married Florence Falcombe in 1878, allegedly comp competing for her hand with Oscar Wilde. Moving to London with his new wife in 1879, Stroker took up the position of business manager at the popular Lyceum Theatre in the West End, a post he would keep for over 25 years. The links he formed at the theatre allowed him to access, allowed him access to literally, literary London and the freedom to travel. To many of the places that inspired his fiction. Stroker's first published full length work was a collection of fairy tales for children, Under the Sunset, published in 1882, followed by his first full length novel, The Snake's Pass, in 1890. His masterpiece, Dracula, the novel that would cement his name in history, was published in 1897. Stoker died in 1912 in London. Read book. 100 Classic Books presents Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter 1 Jonathan Harker's Journal, Captain Shorthand, 3 May, Bloodstrid, Le Left Munich, at 8 35 p.m. on 1st May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6. 46. A train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse of which I got of it. From the train and the little I could walk through the streets, I feared to go very far from the station. As we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east, the most western of splendid bridges over the Dunap, which is here of noble width and depth, took us among the tradition of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time and came after nightfall to Klausenburg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royal I had for dinner, or rather supper. A chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. Ma'am, get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called paprika, hindol, and that as it was a national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere. Along the Carpathians. I found my mattering of German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when in London, I had visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance with a nobleman of that country. I find that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of three states. Transylvania, 
Aldavia, and Parker Rabina. In the midst of the Carpathian's mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe, I was not able to alight on any map or work giving the exact locality of the castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own ordnance survey maps. But I found that Mistress, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my tra travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania, there are four districts, nationalities, Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Decanians, Magyars in the west, and Kelly's in the east and north. I am going among the latter who claim to be descendants from Attila the, and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the center of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Now, I must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. Strange dreams. Yeah, modern day talk. Anyway, there was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it. Or it may have had the... <laughs> have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe, and was still thirsty. Towards morning, I slept and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door. So I guess I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika, and a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they said was mamiliga and egg plant stuffed with forcemeat, force meat. a very ex excellent dish, which they call implatata. Yeah. Get recipe for this also. I had to hurry breakfast for the train started a little before eight, or rather it ought to have done so, for after rushing to the station at 7.30, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought they to be in China? All day long, we seemed to dawdle through a country which had full of beauty, which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. It takes a lot of water, and running strong to sweep the outside edge of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the peasants at home, or though I saw coming through France and Germany with short jackets and round hats and home-made trousers. But others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when you got near them. But they were very clumsy about the waist. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or other, and most of them had big, belt, big belts with a lot of st strips of something fluttering from them, like the dresses in a ballet. But of course, there were petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slav Bucks, who were more barbarian than the rest, with our big cowboy hats, great baggy, dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous heavy leather belts. Near foot wide, all studded over with brass nails. They were, they wore high boots with their trousers stuck into them, and had long black hair and heavy black mustaches. They are very picturesque, but do not look prepossessing. 
on the stage, they would be sat down at once as some old oriental band of brigands. They are, however, I am told, very harmless and rather wanting in nature, self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistris, which is a very interesting old place, being practically on the frontier for the Borgo. Pass leads from it into Bugovinia. It has had a very stormy existence, and it certainly flows, certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people. The casualties of war proper being, being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found, to my great delight, to be thoroughly old-fashioned. For, of course, I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door, I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the unusual peasant dress. White undergarments with long double apron, front and back of colored stuff fitting almost too tight for her When I came close to she bowed and said, The hair, Englishman, yes? I said, Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt sleeves who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to... The Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence, the diligence will start for Bukovina. A place on its, on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and will bring you to me. I tr trust that your journey from London has been a happy one and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. 4th of May. I found that my landlord had ju had got a letter from the count, directed directing him to secure the best place on the couch for me, couch for me. But on making inquiries as to details, he seemed somewhat reticent and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true because up to then he had understood it perfectly. At least, he answered my questions, exactly as if he did he and his wife. The old lady who had received me looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, he could tell me any anything of his castle. Both he and his wife crossed themselves and saying that they knew... Nothing at all. Simply refused to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip of what Germans she knew, and mixed it all up with some other language, which I did not know at all. And I was just able to follow her by asking many questions. When I told her that I must go at once, and that I was engaged on important business, she asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered that it was the 4th of May. She shook her head as she said again, Oh, yes, I know that. I know that, but do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on, It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do not go. Do you not know what tonight when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going and what you are going to. She was in such evident 
distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally, she went down to, on her knees and implored me not to go. At least, to wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous. But I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business, I had business to be done. And I could allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up and said as gravely as I could that I thanked her. But my duty was imperative and that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes and taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I did not know what to do for as an English churchman, I have been taught to regard such things as in some measure idolatrous. And yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady meaning so well and in such a state of mind she saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put the rosary around my neck and said, For your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I'm writing up this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still round my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, or the many ghostly traditions of this place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know, but I am not feeling nearly as easy and easy in my mind as usual. If this book should ever reach Mina before I do let it bring my goodbye, here comes the coach. 5th of May, the castle. The gray of the morning has passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged. Whether with trees or hills, I do not know. For it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be ca called till I awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down, and lest who read them may fancy that I dined too well before I left Bistris. Let me put down my dinner exactly. I dined on what they call robber steak. Bits of bacon, onion, and beef, seasoned with red pepper, and strung on sticks, and roasted over the fire, in the simple style of the London's cat meat. The wine was golden, meatish, which produces a queer string sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I had only a couple of glasses of this, and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, and I saw him taking, talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking to me, for every now and then they looked at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they call by a name meaning wood be word bearer, came and listened to me. I came and listened, and then looked at me. Most of them, pityingly, I could hear a lot of words of ten repeated queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd. So I quickly got my polygot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say they were not cheering to me, for amongst them were or dog, Satan, Pokol, Hell, Stragoka, Witch, Brolock, and Velusklock. Both of which mean the same thing, one being Slovak and the other Cerverian. For something that is either werewolf or vampire. Ma'am, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me. Just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man 
but every one seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn yard and its crowd of picturesque fighters, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange trees and green t tubs clustered in the center of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, Gatsa, they call them, cracked his big whip over his tower small horses, which ran ab abreast, and we set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly tears in the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although had I known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forest and woods, with here and there steep hills, crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses. The blink gable end to the road. There was everywhere a build bewildering mass of fruit, blossom, tr apple, plum, pear, cherry, and as we drove I could see the green grass under the trees, strangled with the fallen petals and, and out amongst these green hills of what they ca call here the middle land. Ran the road, losing half, losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve, or was shut out by the strangling ends of the pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but still we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Borgo Pond. Burgo print. I was told that this road is in summertime excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snow. In this respect, it is different from the general runs of run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of old, the hospitals would not repair them lest the Turks should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops and so hasten the war, which was already really as loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the middle land rose mighty slopes of forest up to lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered with the afternoon sun, falling full upon them and bringing out all the glorious colors of this beautiful range deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where green grass and rock mingled, and as, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed cracks, till these were themselves lost in the distance, where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty, snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Istinzek, God's seat, as he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep around us. This was emphasized by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset, and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that Goiter was painfully prevalent by the roadside where many crosses and we swept by many, by my companions all crossed themselves. 
Here and there was a present man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn round as we approached, but seemed as seemed in the self surrender of devotion, to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me, for instance, hay ricks and the trees, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a lighter wagon, the ordinary presence cart with its long snake-like vertebra, calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On the, this were very, on this were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants. The Czechs with their white and sovaks, with their colored sheepskins and leather, carrying lance fashion, their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness. The gloom of the trees, oak, beech, and pine, though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hills, as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes as the road was cut through the pine woods, it seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us. Great masses of grayness, which here and there bestowed the trees, produced a peculiar, peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies endured early or in the evening when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds which amongst the Carpathians seemed to be seemed to wind ceaselessly through valleys sometimes the hills were so steep that despite our driver's haste the horses were only could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them as we do at home, but the diner would be, not hear of it. No, no, he said. You must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. And then he added with what he evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pat pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses unmercifully with his long whip, and with wild cries of encouragement, urged them on to further excursions. Then through the darkness I could see a sort of patch of gray light ahead of us. As though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come near to us on each side, and to frown down upon us. We were entering on the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with an earnestness, which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith with a kindly word and a blessing and that strange mixture of fear meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Mistress. The sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then as we flew along, the driver leaned forward and on each side of the passengers craning over the edge of the coach peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something was something very exciting was either happening or expected. But though I asked each passenger, no one 
would give me the slightest explanation. The state of excitement kept on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening up, opening out on the eastern side. There were dark, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive st sense of thunder had seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres, and that now we had got into the thunderous one. I was now myself looking out for the clairvoyance which was to take me to the count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which the steam from our hard driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could now see the soundy road lying white before us, but there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking that I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something that which I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone, I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then, turning to me, he said in German, worse than my own, There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina and return tomorrow or the next day, before the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and a universal crossing of themselves, a calash with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps, as the rays fell on them, that the horses were coal-black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lampshade, the lamplight. As he turned to us, he said to the driver, You are early, you are early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply. The English hare was in a hurry, to which the stranger replied, That is why I suppose you wished him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he spoke, he smiled, and the lamp light fell on a hard-working mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another the line from Burger's Lenore, Den D. Todd Ten Ray, in Ten Schnell. For the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away, at the same time putting out his two fingers and crossing them himself. And crossing himself. Give me the hare's luggage, said the driver, and without exceedingly electricity, my bags were handed out and put in the calash. Then I descended from the side of the coach. As the calash was close alongside the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm and a grip of steel, his strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook his reins. The horses turned and we swept into the darkness of the past. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach by the light of the lamps and projected against it the figures of my late companions, crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to his horses, and off they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill, and a lonely feeling came over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders, and a rug across my knees. And the driver said in excellent German, the night is chill, mine hair, and my master, the Count, bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Solovitz 
the plum brandy of the country underneath the seat if you should require it i do not i did not take any but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same i felt a little strangely and not a little frightened i think had there been any alternative i should have taken it instead of pr prose prosecuting that unknown night journey the carriage went at a hard pace straight along then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road it seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again and so i took note of some salient po point and found that this was so i would have liked to have asked the driver what this all meant but i really feared to do so for i thought that place placed as I was, any protest would have been, had no effect, in case there had been an intention to delay. By and by. However, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match, and by its flame, looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse far down the road, a long, agonizing wailing, as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another and another, till a born of the born on the wind, which now sighed softly through the pass, a wild howling began, which seemed to come from all over the country as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. At the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the driver took, driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated as though after a run away from sudden fright. Then far off in the distance from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and a sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way. For I was minded to jump from the calash and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly so that the driver had to use all his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and to stand before them. He petted and soothed them and whispered, whispered something in their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing, and with extraordinary effect, far under my caresses, they became quite manageable again, though they still trembled. The driver again took his seat, and shaking his reins, started off at a great pace, this time after going to the far side of the pass. He suddenly tore him down a narrow road which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed in with trees, which in pe places arched right over the roadway till we were p till we passed as through a tunnel, and again great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in a shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks and the branches of the trees crashed together as we swept along it grew colder and colder still, and fine powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered with a white blanket. The keen w wind still carried the howling of the docks, though this grew fainter as we weren't on our way, as we went on our way. The bang of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing round on us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear. The driver, however, was not in the least disturbed. He kept turning his head to left and right, but I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw a faint flickering blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses and jumped to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do. 
Nevertheless, as the howling of the wolves grew closer, but while I was wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, and without a word took his seat, and we resumed our journey. I think I might, I think I must have fallen asleep, and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeated endlessly. And now, looked, looking back, it is like a sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road. One moment, I'm going to get something to drink. Not even in the darkness around us, I could watch the driver's no motions. It went rapidly to where the blue flame arose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illuminate the places around us around it at all. In gathering a few points some to us, one appeared a strange optical effect. When he stood between me and the flame, he did not obstruct it, for I could see its ghostly flicker all the same. It startled me, for but as the effect was only momentarily I took it that my eyes deceived me straining through the darkness. Then for a time there were no blue flames, and we sped onward through that gloom with the howling of the wolves around us, as though they were following in a moving circle. At last there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had yet gone, and during his absence the horses began to tremble worse than ever and to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause for it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. But just then, the moon sailing through the black clouds appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling, pine-clad rock. In by its light, I saw around us a ring of wolves, with white teeth and lolling green, lolling red tongues, with long Sunni limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them than even when they howled for my salt. I felt a sort of paralysis for fear, of fear. It is only when a man feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true impact or import. All at once the wolves began to howl, as though the moonlight had been had had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared and looked helplessly round with eyes that rolled in a way painful to see. For the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had forced to remain within it. I called to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break out through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the calèche, hoping by the noise to scare the wolves from that side so as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there, I knew not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound, saw him stand in the roadway as he swept his long arms as though brushing aside from some impalpable obstacle. The wolves fell back and back further still. Just then a heavy cloud passed across the right face of the moon, so that we were again in darkness. When I could see again, the driver was climbing into the calèche, and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny for uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me, and I was afraid to speak or move. The time seemed interminable as we swept on our way. Now in almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon, we kept on ascending with occasional periods of quick descent, but in the main always ascending. Suddenly became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling up the horses in the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, from whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken 
battlements showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky. Chapter 2, Jonathan Harker's Journal Continued Rhythm A. I must have been asleep, for certainly if I had been fully awake, I must have noticed the approach of such a remarkable place. In the gloom, the courtyard looked of considerable size, and as several dark ways led from it, and under great round arches, uh, it perhaps seemed bigger than it really is. I have not yet been able to see it by daylight. When the calash stopped, the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight. Again, I could not but notice his prodigious strength. His hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he had chosen. Then he took out my traps and placed them on the ground beside me. As I stood close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails, and sat in a projecting doorway of massive stone, I could see even in the dim light that the stone was massively carved, but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather. As I stood, the driver jumped again into his seat and shook the shook the reins. The horses startled for, started forward and the trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. A bell or knocker, there was no sign. There was no, there was no sign. Though these frowning walls and dark window opening, it was not likely that my voice could pre penetrate. The time I waited seemed endless and I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. What sort of place had I come to, and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure was it on which I had embarked? Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's, solicitor's clerk sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Solicitor's clerk. Mina would not like that solicitor or just before leaving london i got word that my examination was successful and i am now a full-blown solicitor i began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if i were awake it all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me and i expected that i should suddenly awake and find myself at home with the dawn struggling in through the windows, as I had now and again felt in the morning after a day of work, but my flesh answered. A pinching test, and my eyes were not to be deceived. I was indeed awake and among the Carpathians. All I could do now was to be patient, and to wait the coming of the morning, just as I had come to this conclusion. I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door, and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. Then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. A key was turned with the loud grating noise of long disuse, and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven, save for a long white mustache, and clad in black. Med to foot, without a single speck of coat about him. Anywhere he held in his hand an antique silver lamp, in which the flame burned without chimney or globe of any kind, throwing long quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. The old man motioned me in with his right hand, with a courteous, courtly gesture, saying in excellent English, but with a strange intonation. Welcome to my house. Enter freely of your own wind of your own will. He made no notion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue. As though his gesture of 
Welcome had fixed him into stone. The instant, however, that I had stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward and holding out his hand grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice, more like the hand of a dead than a living man. Again he said, Welcome to my house. Come freely. Go safely. And leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen that far a moment. I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said interrogatively, interrogatively, uh, Count Dracula? He bowed in a curtly way as he replied, I am Count... I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome to my home. I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracelet on the wall, and stepping out, took my luggage. He had carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted. Nay, sir, you are my... Yes, it is late and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage and then up a great winding stair. And along another great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this, he threw open a heavy door and I rejoiced to see within a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper and on whose mighty hearth a great file, fire of logs, freshly replenished, flamed and flared. The Count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, and crossing the room. Opened another door, which led into a small octagonal room, lit by a single lamp. And seemingly without a window of any sort, passing through this, he opened another door and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight, for here was a great bedroom, well lighted and well, and warmed with another log fire. Also added to, but lately for the top logs were fresh, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew, saying before he closed the door, "You will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself by making your." Toilet, I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into the other room, where you will find your supper repaired. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So, making a hasty toilet, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who had, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a great swell wave of the, his hand to the table, and said, I pray you be seated and sup. How you please, you will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, for I have dined already, and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I much regret that an attack of gout from which my lady... I am a constant sufferer, forbids absolutely any traveling on my part for some time to come, but I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute, one in whom I have every possible confidence. He is a young man, full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent, and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend on you when you will... 
during his stay and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish. I fell to at I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. This with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old Tokay, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating in the count eating it, the count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time I had finished my supper, and by my host desire had drawn up a chair hair by the fire and began to smoke a cigar which he offered me at the same time excusing myself excusing himself that he did not smoke i had now an opportunity of observing him and found him of a very marked phys nomy. his face was a strong a very strong aquiline with high bridge of the thin nose and Peculiar arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking, with peculiar sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips which remarkably roundness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his ears for the rest his ear his ears were pale and at the tops extremely pointed i'll take a quick commercial break be right back All right, everyone, welcome back. The chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm through it, though thin. The general, general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto, I had noticed the backs of his hands, 
as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine. But seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice that they were rather coarse, broad, with squat fingers, strange to say, there were hairs in the center of the palm. The nails were long and fine, and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over to me, over me, and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count evidently noticed it, drew back, and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done with his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent with a, for a while, and as I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There seemed a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened, I heard of it, I heard as if from down below, if in the valley, the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the chosen of the night, what music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as though at as late as you will, I have to be away till the afternoon, so sleep and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself. The door to the oct octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear, I think strange things, which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me if only for the sake of those dear to me. Seventh of May, it is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last 24 hours. I slept till late in the day, and awoke of my own accord. When I had dressed myself, I went into the room where we, we, had, sub, where we had supped, and found a cold breakfast laid out, with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the Earth. There was a card on the table in which was written, I have to be absent for a while. Do not wait for me. D. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell, so that I might let the servants know I had finished. But I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are round me. The table service is of gold, and so beautiful wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics, and must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton's court, but there they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilet glass on my table, and I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I had not yet seen a servant anywhere or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. Some time after I had finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock. When I had had it, I looked about for something to eat, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the court's count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper, or even writing materials, so I opened another door in the room and found a sort of library. 
The door up po opposite mine. I tried, but found it locked. In the library, I found, to my great delight, a vast number of English books, whose shelves full of them and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers. A table in the center was littered with English magazines and newspapers, though none of them were of very recent date. The books were of the most varied kind, history, geography, politics, political, econom political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Army and Navy List, and it somehow glad glad in my heart to see it, the Law List. Whilst I was looking at the books, the door opened, and the Count entered. He saluted me in a hearty way, and hoped that I had had a good re night's rest. Then he went on. I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions... And he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me. And for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Though through them, I have come to know your great England. And to know her is to love her. I long to go through your crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books, to you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed greatly. Bravely, I thank you, my friend, for all for your all too flattering estimate. But yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road. I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know th that. Did I move and s speak in your London? Well, I know that. Did I move and speak in your London? None there are who would know, not know me. A stranger. There is not enough for me. Here I am noble. I am boyar. The common people know me, and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land. He is, he is no one. Men him... Men know him not, and to know not is to care not for. I am constant, if I am like the rest, so that a that no man step stops in, that no man stops if he sees me or pause in his speaking, if he hear my words. Ha ha, a stranger, I have been so long, master, that I would. Be master still, or at least that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone as agent of my friend Peter Hawkins of exterior, to me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here with me for a while. So that by our talking, I may learn the English intonation, and I would like, I would, and I would that you tell me when I make error, even of the smallest. In my speaking, I am sorry that I had to be away for so long today. But you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important affairs in hand. Uh, of course, I said all, all I could about being willing and asking if I might come into that home when I chose, he answered, Yes, certainly, and added, You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except 
where the doors are locked. Where, of course, you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are. And did you see with my eyes, you know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this. And then he went on. We are in Transylvania. And Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways. And there shall be to you... Many strange things, nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversations, and as it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only the talking's sake, I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me or come within my notice. Some things, sometimes he sheared off the subject or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand, but generally he answered all I asked most. Frankly. Then, as time went on, and I had got somewhat bolder, I asked him of th some of the strange things as the preceding night, as for instance, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue, blue flames. He then explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night, of the year last night, in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway. A blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been well hidden, he went on. In the region where which you come came last night, there can be but little doubt, for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Wallachin, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a room of soil in all that this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men. Patriots are invaders. In old days, there were stirring times. When the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes, and the Patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the ch children too, and waited there coming on the rocks above the passes, that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little for whatever there was had been so sheltered in the friendly soil. But now, said I, can it have remained so long undiscovered when there is a sure index to it if men will but take their trouble to look the count smiled and as his lips ran back along over his gums the long sharp canine teeth shower showered out because he answered because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool those flames only appear at one night and on that night, no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And, dear sir, even if he didn't, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasant that you tell me, of who marked the place of the flame, would not know where he, to look in daylight for his own work. Even you would not, I dare, be sworn be able to find these places again. There you are right, I said. I know not, I know no more of the dead where even to look for them. Then he drifted into another matter. Come, he said at last. Tell me of the London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from, the, from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order i heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room and as i passed through noticed that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit for it was by this time deep into the dark the lamps were also lit in the study of or library and i found the count lying on the sofa reading of all things in the world an english broadshaw's guide when i came in he cleared the books and papers from the table and with them, I went into the plans and deeds and figures and of all sorts. 
He was interested in everything and asked me a myriad question about the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighborhood. For he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well, but, my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be all alone, and my friend, Harker Jonathan, may, nay, pardon me. I fall into my country's habit of putting your p patronomic first. My friend, Jonathan Harker, will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be an exterior miles away, probably working my papers of the law with my other friend, Peter Harkins. So, we went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Purfleet. When I had told him the facts and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a paper, written a letter with them, ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes which I had made at the time, and which I had inscribed here at Purfleet on a by-road. I came across just such a place as seemed to be required, and where was displayed to a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It is surrounded by a high wall, an ancient structure built of high, heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gate are of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, uh, no doubt a corruption of the old Quatre face, as the house is foresighted agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains an all some 20 acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it, which make it in places gloomy and there is a deep dark looking pond or small lake evidently fed by some springs as the water is clear and flows away in a fair sized stream the house is very large and of all periods back i should say to medieval times for one part is of stone immensely thick with only a few windows high up and heavily barred with iron, it looks like part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key or the door leading to it from the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house had been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are, there are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house only recently added to and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is odd, old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made habitable in a day. And after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not only to think that our bones may lie among the common dead. I seek not gately nor mirth, not the bright voluptuousness of much sunshine and sparkling waters, which please the young and the gay. The young, yes. I am no longer young, and my heart, through weary years of mourning over the dead, is now attuned to mirth. Oh, moreover, the walls of my castle are broken. The shadows are many, and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements. I love the shade in the chateau, and would be alone with my thoughts when I may. 
Somehow his words and his look did not seem to accord. Or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine. Precisely with an excuse, he left me, asking me to put all my papers together. He was some little time away, and I began to look at some of the books around me. One was an atlas, which I found open naturally at England, as if that map had been much used. On looking at it, I found in certain places little rings marked, and on examining these, I noticed that one was near London, on the east side, manifestly where his new estate was situated. The other two were Ex Exeter and Whitby on the Yorkshire coast. It was the better part of an hour when the Count returned. Aha! he said. Still at your books. Good. But you must not work always. Come, I am informed that your supper is ready. He took my arm and we went into the next room, where I found an excellent supper ready on the table. The Count again excused himself, as he had died out on his being away from home. But he sat as on the previous night, and chattered whilst I ate. After supper, I talked, as on the last, last evening. And the Count stayed with me, chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject, hour after hour. I felt that it was getting very late indeed but I did not say anything where I felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way. I was not sleepy as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me, but I could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of the dawn, which is like, in its way, the turn of the tide. They say that people who are near death die generally at the change of the dawn or at the time at the turn of the tide. Anyone who has when tired and tied, as it were, to his post, experienced this change in the atmosphere, can well believe all at once we heard the crow of a cock coming up with preternatural shrillness through the clear morning air. Count Dracula, jumping to his feet, said, why, there is the morning again. How remiss I am to let you stay up so long. You must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of England. Less interesting, so that I may not forget about how time flies. Bias. And with a, con court and with a courtly bow, he quickly left me. I went into my own room and drew the curtains, but there was little to notice. My window opened into the courtyard. All I could see was the warm gray of quick in sky, so I pulled the curtains again, and have written of this day. 8th of May. I began to fear, as I wrote in this book, that I was getting too diffuse. But now I am glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place, and all in it that I cannot be feel feeling uneasy. I cannot but feel uneasy out of it, or there, or that I have had never come. It may be that this strange my existence is telling on me, but would that there but would that that were all. If there were anyone in to talk to, I could bear it. But there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with. And he, I fear, I am myself the only living soul within the place. So far as facts can, can be. It will help me to bear up an imagination. Imagination must not run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up, I had hung my shaving glass by the window, and was just beginning to 
shape. Suddenly, I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning! I started for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room. Behind me, in starting, I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. This time there could be no error. Well, the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder, but there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it, ex except myself. This was starting... This was startling, and coming on the top of so many strange things was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness, which I always have when the Count is near. But at this, that instant, I saw that the cut had bled a little, the, bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did, so half round to look for what, for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demonic fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe that it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think. You think... More dangerous than you think in this country. Then, seizing the shaving glass, he went on. And this is the wretched thing that has done this, done the mischief? It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it! And opening the heavy window with one, ret with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which had shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave, unless in my watch case or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was repaired, but I could not find the count anywhere. So I breakfasted alone. It is strange that, as yet, I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a pe very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood, there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrible precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach, it is a sea of green, treetops, with occasionally a deep, drip, deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges throughout the forest. But I am not in a heart to describe my describe my beauty, for when I had seen the view, I explored further doors, 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 everywhere. And all looked and bolted, and no place save from the windows in the castle. Walls is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. Castle 3. I mean, Chapter 3. Jonathan Harker's journal continued. When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the convictions of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I looked back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think 
over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only am I certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and as doubtless has own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my own plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself, and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. And if the latter be so, I need and shall need all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut, and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the ch chink of the hinges of the door, laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these men menial officers, surely it is proof that there is no one else to do them. This gave me a fright, for if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself, who was the driver of the couch that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves, as he did, by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at Bistris and on the couch had some terrible fear of me? What meant the giving of the crucifix of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who had hung the crucifix around my neck. For if it is a comfort and a strength to me, for whenever I touch it, it is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavor and as idolatrous could be could, showed in a should in a time of loneliness and the trouble be of help. It is that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that it is a medium, a tangible help, in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort. Sometime, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand tonight he may talk to himself. If I turn the conversation that way, I must be very careful, however, not to awaken his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. Speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them at all. This he after afterwards explained by saying that to a boyar, the pride of his house and name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, we always said, he always said, we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke and walked like the room pulling his, his great white mustache and grasping many things on which he said his, he laid his hands as though he would crush it by main, main strength. One thing he said, which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We Siliskis Sil have a right to be proud. For in our veins flows the blood of many brave races, who fought as the lions fight for lordship. Here in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric 
Trey bore down from Iceland, the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fail intent on the seaboards of Europe, a and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, were found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples hailed that in their veins ran the blood of those who, of those old witches, who expelled from the Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools! What devil or what witch was ever so great at, as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. It is a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, that when the Megyar, the Lombard, and the Arvar, the Bulgar, and the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we were, drove them back. It is strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here, and when he reached the frontier, that the Hung Fog Lalas was completed there, and when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Selikis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. I, and more than that, in this duty of the frontier guard. For as the Turk sleeps, water sleeps, and enemy is sleepless. sleepless. Who, were, who more gladly than we throughout the four nations receive the bloody sword? Four nations received the bloody sword, or as its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king. When was redeemed that great shame of my nation, the shame of Kasova. When the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down beneath the crescent. Who were, was it but one of my own race? Who as Volvor, Volvod crossed the Danube and beat the Turk? on his own ground. This was a Dracula indeed. Woe was it that his own worth unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula indeed who inspired that others of his race, who in a lighter age again and again brought his forces over the great river and the Toki land? Who, when he was beaten, back, back came again, and again, and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah, what good are peasants without a leader? What end, where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it. Again, when after the battle of Mohawks, he threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Selegis and the Draculas, as their hearts blood, their brains and their swords can boast a record that mushroom Growths like the ha Habsburgs and the Romanovs will never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, 
and we went to bed. Ma'am, this diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off and cor cock crow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12th of May. Let me begin with facts, bare, meager facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have some of my own observations, or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters, and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books, and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined in an inn at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge that may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him that he... might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transition, as only one could act at his time, and that to change would be uncertain to relate. Against his interest, he seemed thoroughly to understand, and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend, say to banking and another to look after shipping in case local help were needed in a place far from the home. Of the banking solicitor, I asked him to explain more fully so that I might not be by any chance misleading. So he said, I shall illustrate your friend and mine, Mr. Park Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my place at London. Good. Now here let me say frankly, lest you should think it's strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London. Instead of some one resident there, that my motive was that no local interest might be served, save my wish only, and as one of the London residents might, perhaps have been some purpose of himself or friend to... Herb. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labours should be only to my interest. Now suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover, might it not be that it could be more easy be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answer that I certainly, that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agencies, one for the other, so that local work could be done locally, on instruction, from any solicitor, so that the client himself, simply, so that the client simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at le liberty to direct myself. Is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by in a business, who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one, any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consigns and the forms to be gone through and of all sorts of difficulties, which might arise but be forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to himself, to him, to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do business in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful, when he had satisfied himself on these po points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all of what of well, verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, 
Have you written yourself... Have you written since our your first letter to our friend, Mr. Peter Hawkins? Or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not. That as yet, I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then write down, my f young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder. Write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much. Nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have no, not steined. Is it not so? What can I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him. Not myself, and besides, which Count Dracula was speaking. There was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I had was a prisoner, and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resi resistantly way. Resentless, resistless way. There we go. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of note paper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest paper, of the thinnest foreign post. And looking at them, then at him, and noticing his quiet smile, with a sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood he as well as if he had spoken that I should be careful what I wrote, for he would be. able to read it, so I determined to write only for mole notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins' secret, and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the count. If he did, not, did see it, then I had written my two letters. I sat quiet, reading a book whilst the count wrote several notes, referring as he wrote them to some books on his table. Then he took up my two and placed them with his own, and put by his writing materials, after which the instant the door had closed behind him, I learned over and looked I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no comp complications in doing so. For under the circumstances, I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number seven, the Crescent Whitby, another to Herr Lutner, Verna, and the other was to Courts and Co. London, and the fourth to Heron, Kopstock, and Bill Ruth, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back to my back in my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they had been and to resume my book before the holding is still another letter in his hand, enter the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and then turned to me and said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. In the door he returned, at the door he turned, and after a moment's pause said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend. Nay, let me warn you with all seriousness. 
that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories. And there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned, should sleep now for or ever overcome you, or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber or to these rooms, for your rest will be then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then he finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite I understood. My only doubt was as to whether my dreams, any dream, could be more terrible than that unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing round me. Later, I endorsed the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the bed, over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a long while, he not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me, as compared with the narrow darkness to the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a bath of fresh air, breath of fresh air. Though it were of the night, I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerve. I start at my own I start in my own shadow, and am fully of my of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows there are that there is ground for my terrible fear in this cursed place. I looked out over the beautiful expanse, bathed in soft yellow moonlight, till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light, the distant hills began melt, became melted, and the shadows of the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness, the mere beautiful beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eyes were, my eye was caught by something moving, a story below me, and somewhat to my left, for I imagined from the order of the rooms that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mullioned and though weather-worn was still complete, but it was evidently made a, many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. When What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck in the, in the moment of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands which I had had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very, but my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle walls over the dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow, but I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the, fing the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stone, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downward with considerable speed, just, like, just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, 
and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about what with terrors that I dare not think of think of. Fifteenth of May. Once more that I have seen the Count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downward in a sidelong way, some hundred feet down, and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window when his head had disappeared. I leaned out to try to see more, but without avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now, and thought to use the opportunity to explore more that I had dared to do as yet. I went back to the room, and taking a lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I had expected, and the locks were com comparatively new. But I went down the stair stone stairs to the hall, where I had entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily enough and unhook the great chains, but the door was locked and the key was gone. That key must be in the Count's room. I must watch should his door be unlocked, so that I may get it and escape. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open, but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture, dusty with age and moth-eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway, which, through, though it seemed to be locked, gave a little under pressure. I tried it harder and found that it was not really locked, but that the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had fallen somewhat, and the take a commercial break here be right back All right, everyone, welcome back. Heavy door rested on the floor. Here was an opportunity which I might not have again, so I exerted myself, and with many efforts, forced it back so that I could enter. 
I was now in a wing of the castle, further to the right than the rooms. I knew in a story lower down from the windows, I could see that the suite of rooms lay along to the south of the castle, the windows of the end room looking out both west and south. On the latter, latter side, as well to the former, there was a great precipice. The castle was built on the corner of a great rock, so that on three sides it was quite impregnable, impregnable. And great windows were placed here where a sling or bow or culverin could not reach, and consequently light and comfort impossible to a position where it had to be which had to be guarded or secured to the west was a great valley, and then, rising far away, great jagged mountains, fastness, rising peak on peak. The sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and craneries of the stone. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the wind yellow moonlight flooding in through and diamond panels, flooding on through the diamond panels, diamond panes, enabled one to see even colors, whilst it softened the wealth of dust, which lay over all undisguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamps seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place where it chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come of to hate. From the presence of the count, and after trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen, with much thought and many blushes, her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that had, has happened since I closed it last. It is nine-tenth centuries up to date with its vengeance, and yet, unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had and have powers of their own, which mere modernity cannot kill. Later, the morning of 16th May, God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety, and things of the past, whilst I live on here there is but one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad. If indeed I be not mad already, if I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think that of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place, the Count is the least dreadful to me, and to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose. Great God, merciful God, let me be calm for out of that way lies madness, indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things, which have puzzled me. Up to now, I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick, my tablets, tis meat that I put it down, etc. For now, feeling as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end, and its undoing. I turned to my diary for repose. The habit of interring accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warnings frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now when I think of it, for in future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary, and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket. 
I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind. But I took a pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it, the obstinacy, obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom, which refreshed me. I determined not to return to night in the gloom haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where of old ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives, whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk, away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place, near the corner, so that, as I lay, I could look at the lovely view to east and south, and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust, composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so, but I fear for all that followed was st startlingly real, so real, that now, sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the moon, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. Uh, the room was the same, unchanged in any way, since I came into it. I could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight. My own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accument, accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me, were three young ladies, ladies by their dresses and manner, thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them, for through the moonlight was, though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me, and soothed and looked at me for some time, and then whispered together. Two were dark, and had high aquiline noise, noses, like the count and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when constrained with the pale yellow moon the other was fair as fair as can be with great wavy masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires i seemed somehow to know her face and to know it was in connection with some dream dreamy fear but i could not recall recollect at the moment how or where all three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it shouldn't be Mina's eyes and caused her pain, but it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed, such a silvery musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable tingling sweetness of water glasses. When played on by a cunning hand, the fair girl sh shook her head, coke Whittishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, you are first, and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The others added, He is young and strong, there are kisses for all of us. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fear the fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying like the sweet, a bitter offensiveness, as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuousness which was both thrilling and repulsive, and as she arched her neck she actually licked her lips like an animal, till I could see in the moonlight the moisture 
shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the white sharp teeth lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed about to fasten on my throat then she paused and i could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and could feel the hot breath on my neck then the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer nearer i could feel the soft shivering touch of the lips on the super sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dance of two sharp teeth touching and pausing there i closed my eyes in a language glorious ecstasy and waited waited with beating heart but at that instant another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning i was conscious of the presence of the count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury as my eyes opened involuntarily i saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with giant's power draw it back the blue eyes transformed with fury the white teeth clamping with rage and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion for the count never did i imagine such wrath and fury even to the demons of the pit his eyes were positively blazing the red light in them was lurid as if the flames of hell fire his face was deathly pale and the lines of it were horrid like drawn wires the thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white hot metal with a fierce sweep of his arm he hurled the woman from him and then motioned to the others as though he were beating them back it was the same impetuous stare gesture that i had seen used to the wolves in a voice which though low and almost in a whisper seemed to cut through the air and then ring around the room as he said how dare you touch him any of you how dare you cast eyes on him when i had forbid it back i tell you all this man belongs to me beware how you meddle with him or you'll have to do with me the fair girl with a laugh of ribald quirkery turned to answer him you you yourself never loved to never love on this the other women joined in such a mirthless hard soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear it seemed like the pleasure of fiends then the count turned after looking at my face attentively and said in a soft whisper yes i can lo i can too yes i too can love you yourselves can tell it from the past it is not so well now i promise you that when i am done with him you shall kiss him at your will now go go i must awaken him for there is work to be done are we to have nothing tonight said said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor and which moved as through though there were some living thing within it for answer he nodded his head one of the women jumped forward and opened it if my ears did not deceive me there was a gasp and a low wail as of a half smothered child the woman closed round whilst i was aghast with horror but as i looked with they disappeared and with them in a dreadful bag there was no door near them and they could not have passed me without my noticing they simply seemed to fade into the rays of the matte moonlight and pass out through the window for i could see outside them shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded then the horror overcame me and i sank down unconscious chapter four jonathan harker's journal continued i awoke in my own blood if it be that i had not dreamt 
The Count must have carried me here. I tried to satisfy myself on this subject, but could not arrive at any unquestioning, unquestionable result, to be sure. There were certain small evidences, such as that my clothes were folded and laid by in a manner which was not my habit. My watch was still unwound, and I am rigorously accustomed to wind it at the last thing before going to bed. And many such details, but these things are no proof. For they may have been evidences that my mind was not as usual, and from some cause or another, I had certainly been much upset. I must watch for proof of one thing I am gl I am glad. If it was that the Count carried me here and undressed me, he must have been hurried in his task, for my pockets are intact. I am sure that this diary would have been a mystery to him, to him which he would not have proved. He would have taken or destroyed it. As I look round this room, although it has been to me so full of fear, it is now a sort of sanctuary. For nothing can be more dreadful than those awful women who were, who are waiting to suck my blood. 18th of May. I have been down to look at that room again in daylight, for I must know the truth when I got to the door way at the top of the stairs I found it closed. It had been so forcibly driven against the gem that part of the wood work was splintered. I could see that the bolt of the lock had not been shot, but the door is fastened from the inside. I fear it was no dream and must act on this surmise. 19th of May. I am surely in, I am surely in the toils. Last night, the Count asked me in the suavest tones to write three letters, one saying that my work was he work here was nearly done and that I should start m for home within a few days. Another that I was st starting on the next morning from the time of the letter and the third that I had left the castle and arrived in mistress. I would fain have rebelled, but felt that in the present state of things, it would be madness to quarrel openly with the count whilst I am so absolutely in his power and to refuse would be to excite his suspicion and to arouse his anger. What anger? He knows that I know too much and that I must not li live L lest I be dangerous to him. My only chance is to prolong my opportunities. Something may occur which will give me a chance to I shall I saw in his eyes something of that gathering wrath which was manifest when he hurled that fair woman from him. He explained to me that posts were few and uncertain, and that my writing now would ensure he is a mind to my friends, and he assured me with so much impressiveness that he would countermand countermand the later letters, which would be held over at Bistris. Until due time in case chance would admit of my prolonged my stay. That to oppose him would have been to create new suspicion. I therefore pretended to fall in with his views and asked him what dates I should put on letters. He calculated as a moment and then said, The first should be June 12th, the second June 19th, and the third June 29th. I know now the span of my life. God help me. I know now the span of my life. God help me. 28th of May. There is a chance of escape, or at any rate, of being able to send word home. A band of Sassani have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. Those Sassani are gypsies. I have not notes of them in my books. They are particular, peculiar so that this part of the world, though allied to the ordinary gypsies of the world over, 
There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania, who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves as a role to some great noble or buyer, and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition, and they talk only their own varieties of the Romani language, Romani tongue. I shall write some letters home, and shall try to get them to have them. Posted. I have already spoken them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off and made obeisance and made signs. Obscenities. No, no. Obeisance and made signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters Mina's in, Mina is in shorthand, and I simply ask Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her I have explained my situations, but without the horrors which I may only surmise, it would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her, should the letters not carry. Then the Count shall not yet know my secret, or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters, I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece, and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed, and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to the study and began to read. As the Count did not come in, I have written here, The Count has come, he sat down beside me, and the, said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters. The Cezanne has given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care. See? He must have looked at it. One is from you and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other... Here he caught sight of the strange symbol as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed. Well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held letter and envelope and the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins that I shall, of course, send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you n not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow, handed me a clean envelope. I could only redirect him and hand it to him in silence. When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When an hour or two after, the Count came quietly into the room. His coming wakened me for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk to night, since there are many laborers to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed, and strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair has its own calms. 31st of May. This morning, when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some paper and envelopes for my bag and keep them in my pocket so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again, I, a surprise, again a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my, mem my memoranda, relating to railways and travel, my letter to, of credit, in fact, all that might be useful to me where I once, outside the castle, I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me, and I made search of my portmanteau, and in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. 
The suit in which I had traveled was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere. This looks this look like some new scheme of villainy. 17th of June. This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgeling my brains, I heard without a crackling of whips and pounding and scraping of horses' feet up the rocky path beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yards two great leader wagons, each drawn by eight sturdy horses, and at the head of each pair a Slovak with his wide hat, great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin, and high boots. They had also their long song, their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall, as I thought this, as I thought that way might be open for them. Again, a shock. My door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and car- cried to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed. But just then, the hetman of the Zani came out. And seeing them pointing to my window, said something, at which they laughed. Henceforth, no effort of mine. No. Piteous cry or agonized entity would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The later wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope. These were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handed them, and by their as renaissance resonance resonance as they were roughly moved when they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard. The Slovaks were given some money by the Suzani, and the spitting on it for luck was lazily each up to his horse's head. Shortly afterwards, I heard the crackling of their whips die away in the distance. 24th of June. Before morning last night, the Count left me early and locked himself into the, his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the wind winding stair and looked out of the window, which opened south. I thought I would watch for the count, for there is something going on. The Cezani are quartered somewhere in the castle, and are doing work of some kind. I know it. For now, and then I hear a far away muffled sound, as a maddock and spade. And whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window ha- somewhat less than half an hour. When I saw some one thing coming out of the count's window, I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I wore, which I had worn whilst traveling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the woman take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb too, and in my. Uh, this, then, is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me, as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall be the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage on, it makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here, a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law, which is even a criminal's right in consultation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the Moonlight. There were, they were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled around and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. 
I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position, so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up. A low, piteous howling of dogs, somewhere far below in the valley, which had hidden from my sight. Louder it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound. As they danced in the moonlight, I felt myself struggling to awake to some call of my instincts. Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into the mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered till the, they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started, broad awake and in fully full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes which were becoming gradually materialized from the moonbeams were those of the three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled, and felt somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence, deep, awful silence, which chilled me with a beating heart. I tried the door, but I was locked in my prison, and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard without the agonized cry of a woman. I rushed to the window, and throwing it up, peered out between the bars. There indeed was a woman with disheveled hair, holding her hands over her heart, as one distressed with running. She was leaning against a corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward, and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster! Give me my child. She threw herself on her knees, and raising up her hands, cried the same words and tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair, and beat her breast, and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh, metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide, by the howling of wolves. Before many min minutes had passed, a pack of them poured like a pent-up dam. When liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard, there was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves had was but short. Before long, they seemed away, singly licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thrall of night and gloomy and fear? Gloom and fear. 25th of June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove, as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear, my fear fell from me as if it had been a papurious garment, which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post, and the first of that fatal series, which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it, action. It has always been at night time that I have been or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet 
seeing the count in the daylight? Can it be that he sleeps when others awake, that he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room, but there is no possible way. The door is always locked. No way for me. Yes, there is a way. If one dares to take it where his body has gone, why may not even why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can only be death, and a man's death is not a cult's. And the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina. If I fail, goodbye, my faithful friend. And second, father. Goodbye, all and last of all, Mina. Same day later. I have made the effort, and God helping me. Have come safely back to this room. I must pull, punt down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh straight to the window on the south side, and at once my got outside on the narrow ledge of stone, which runs around the building on this side. The stones are big and roughly cut, and the mortar has by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful death would not overcome me. But after that, kept my eyes away from it. I know pretty well the direction and distance of the count's window and made for it as well as I could, having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy. I suppose I was too excited and the time seemed ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the window sill and trying to rise up the sash. I was filled with agitation, however, when I bent down and slid feet foremost in through the window. Then I looked around for the count, but with the surprise and gladness made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms, and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds, Roman and British and Australi uh, Austrian and Hungarian and Greek and Turkish money covered with a film of dust, as though it had lain long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than 300 years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jeweled, but all of them old and strained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it, for since I could not find the key of the room or the key of the outer room, which was the main object of my search. I must make further examination, or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended mining carefully where I went, for the stairs were dark, being only wet by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom, there was a dark tunnel-like passage through which came a deathly, sickly odor, the odor of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. At last, I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar and found myself in an old ruined chapel, which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places were steps leading to vaults. But the ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. There was no body about, and I made my 
and made search for any further outlet, but there was none. Then I went over in every inch of the ground, so as not to lose a chance. I went down every even I went down even into the vaults where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dirt. And the third, however, I made a discovery. There in one of the great boxes in which there were fifty in all on a pile of newly dug earth lay the count. He was either dead or asleep. I could not say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death. And the cheeks had the warmth of life. Through all their pallor, the lips were as red as ever, but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there long, for the earthly smell would have passed away in a few hours by the side of the road, by the side of the box, was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them dead through and through, though, and in them dead though they were, such a look of hate through unconscious of me or my prisons, that I fled from the place and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall, regaining my room chamber. I threw myself panting upon the bed and tried to think. 29th of June. Today is the date of my last letter, and the Count has taken steps to provide, to prove that it was genuine. For again, I saw him leave the castle the same window and in my clothes as he went down the wall lizard fashion i wished i had a gun or some lethal weapon that i might destroy him but i fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him i dared not want, wait to see him return for i feared to see those weird sisters i came back to the library and read there till i fell asleep I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man can look, as he said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England. I to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Cezanne, who have some labors of their own here, and also come some Slovaks when they have gone. My carriage shall come for you and shall be and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistris, but I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him and determined to test his sincerity. Sin sincerity, it seems like a profanation of the word to write it in su connection with such a pr monster. To ask him point blank, why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled. Such a soft, smooth thank you. Hello, Pepper. Thank you for the hearts. Di diabolical smile. Then I knew there was some trick between behind his smoothness. He said, And your baggage. I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said, with a sweet courtesy which made me rub my eyes, it seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart, for its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome to the welcome the coming speed, the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. 
Not an hour shall you wait in my... Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will, though sad am I at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With a saintly gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at my hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of the hand of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seemed to keep to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment, he proceeded in his stately way to the door, drew back the ponderous bolts, unhooked the heavy chains, and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all around, but could see no sign of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws and clamping teeth and their blunt clawed feet as they leaped came in through the opening door. I knew then that to struggle at the moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command, I could do nothing. But still, the door continued slowly to open, and open, and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly it struck me that this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea great enough for the Count. And as a last chance, I cried out, Shut the door. I shall wait till morning. And covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence, we returned to the library, and after a minute or two, I went to my own room. The last of the last I saw of Count Dracula was him kissing his hand to me, with a red light of triumph in his eyes, and with a smile that Judas and Hell might be proud of. When I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened, and lest my ears deceive me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back, to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait, have patience. Tonight is mine. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, th they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. It is then so near. Is it? It is then so near the end. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Lord help me and those to whom I am dear. Thirtieth of June, morning. These may be the last words I have ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I woke, threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came I, he should find me ready. At last I felt this, that subtle change in the air, and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cock crow, and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart I opened my door, and ran down to the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains, and drew back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despite despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door and shook it till, massive as it was, it rattled in the casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the count. Then a wild desire took me to obtain that key at any risk. And I determined then and there to scale the wall again and again and gain the Count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled 
down the wall. As before, into the Count's room, it was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair case. Let's do down the winding stairs and along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough there, where to find the monster I saw. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid was laid on it, not fastened down, but with the nails ready in their places. To be hammered home, I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall, and then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and mustache were changed to dark iron gray, the cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips there were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and on the neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen fat flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature were simply gorged with blood. He lay with a, like a filthy leech, exhausted with his reflation. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contract, but... I had to search, or I was lost. The coming night might seem my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the count. There was a mocking face, there was a mocking smile on the bloated face, which seemed to drive me back mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where perhaps for centuries to come he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever-widening circle of de semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A uh, terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand, but I seized a shovel which the workmen had been using to fill the cases, and lifting it high struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did, so the head turned and the eyes fell upon, full upon me, with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face, merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had was of the blade bloated face, blood stained and fixed with a grin of malice, which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought, what should be, what should be my next move? But my brain seemed to on fire and I waited with a despairing feeling growing over me. As I waited, I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices, coming closer and through their song, the rolling of heavy wheels and the crackling of whips. The Sisani and the Slovaks, of whom the Count had spoken, were coming. With a last look around at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained the Count's room. Determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened with strained ears, I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of the key and the great lock falling back of the heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked doors. Then there came the sound of many feet tr trampling and dying away in some passage, which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, 
where I might find the new entrance. But at the moment, there seemed to come a violent puff, to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that set the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing around me more closely. As I write this, as I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many trampling feet and the crash of weights. Before I sat down, being set down heavily, doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth, there is a sound of ham hammering. It is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet trampling again along the hall, with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut, and the chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdraw, then another door opens and shuts. I hear the crackling of lock and bolt. Hark, in the courtyard and down the rocky way. The roll of heavy wheels and the crack of whips and the chorus of the Sagani as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women, Fa. Mina is a woman, and there is a knot in common. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall farther than I have ever have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may find a way from this dreadful place, and then a way for home, a way to the quickest and nearest train, a way from this cursed spot from this cursed land where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At last, God's mercy is. I'm going to take a commercial break and we'll be right back. All right, everyone, welcome back. Better than that, of these monsters, and the precipice is steep and high, as its foot a man may sleep, as a man 
Goodbye all. Mina. Chapter 5. Letter from Miss Mina Murray of Miss Lucy Western. 9th of May. My dearest Lucy. My dearest Lucy, forgive me. Forgive my long delay in writing, for I may have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you, and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castle in the air. I have been working very hard lately, because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practicing shorthand very assiduously. When we are married, I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practicing very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep a diary of the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a, short, a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day, if there is in it anything worth sharing, but it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I can, what I see lady journalists do, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on, or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. However, I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well, and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean, Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye, your loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You may not t told me anything for a little time. I hear rumors, and especially of all T of a tall, handsome, curled-haired man. Letter Lucy Western uh, to Ma Mina Murray. 17th Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a very being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to, of interest to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries, and for walks and rides in the, in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me who had the last pop. Someone... Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mama get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago. A man that you would just do for, would ju just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent party. Being handsome, well off, and of good birth, he is a doctor and f really clever. Just fancy, he is only tw nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum, all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he 
called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely in impenetrable. I can fancy what a wonderful person he must have over wonderful power he must have over his pa patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as of trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself. He has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study. It gives you more trouble than you have well fancy if you have ever tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is a slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day there is all out Mina. Every day. There it is all out Mina. We have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together, and eaten together, and laughed, and cried together. For now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me. So in words, but, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him. I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire, undressing, as we used to sit. And I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop. For I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at, all, at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers. Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter Lucy Westerner to Mina Murray. 24th of May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today. Had a pro uh, not a real proposal. And today I have had three, just fancy. Three proposals is one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three pro proposals? But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas and imagining themselves injured and slighted if it, if in their first day at home they did not get six and least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret dear, from every one except of course jonathan you would tell him because i would if i were in your place certainly tell arthur a woman ought to tell her husband everything don't you think so dear and i must be fair men like women certainly their wives too be quiet as fair as they are and women I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with a strong jaw and a good forehead. 
He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things, and remembered him. But he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, although he had known me so little, and what his life would be without me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry, he cr saw, said that he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head his he hands trembled, and then with some hesitation he asked me if I cared already for any one else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt this sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both of my hands in his and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted, being proposed to him, to it, being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow whom you know loves you honestly going away and looking all broken hearted, and to know that no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing quite out of his life, my dear. I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came... After lunch, he is such a nice fellow, an American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh that it seems almost impossible that he had been to so many places and has had such adventures. I sympathize with poor Des Demona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. Skip. Let's skip the awkwardness of that. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man would save us from fears, and we'd marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man, and wanted to know a girl love. No, I think, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any. And yet, my friend, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy B. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helping him all I could. I am not ashamed to say it. Now, I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so, does to, so to strangers. Or before him, for he is really quite well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it assumed me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I'm afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it be. It fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I ever shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it. 
as I have never heard him use any as of yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is you, we'll go join them, seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the long road to t together driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly that it didn't seem hard to, so hard to refuse him as it did for Dr. Stewart. So I said as lightly as I could that I did not know anything of hitching and that I wasn't broken to harness as of yet at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so on the grave, on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect tor torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him. For he suddenly stopped and said with a short of manly fervour that I could have loved him, for if I had been free. Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl. I know I should not be here speaking to you as I am now, if I did not believe you clean grit, right before I, to the very depths of the, your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there any one else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again. But will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman i burst into tears i am afraid my dear you will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one and i already felt very badly why can't they let a girl marry three men or as many as they want and save all this trouble but this is hearsay and i must not say it i am glad to say that though i was crying i was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him out straight, yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came to his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine. I think I put them into his hands. I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than any than being in some in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness well, he'd better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish anyhow, my dear. I'm going to have a pretty lonely 
walk between this and Kingdom Come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now, and then you can, you know, if you lack for darkness now, and then you can, you know, if you lack. For that other f good fellow, you must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him, hasn't quite spoken yet. That quite... That quite won me over, Minna, for it was brave and sweet of him, and no, noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he said, so sad. So I leaned over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I am afraid I was blushing very much, he said, Little girl. I hold your hand, and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out to the room, without looking back, without a tear or a quiver, or a pause, and I am crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy when... There are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on. I know I would if I were free. Only I don't want to be free, my dear. This quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just as once. Just at once. After telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever yours, loving Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I didn't tell you of number three, did I? Besides, it was all so confusing. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were round me, and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness, for to me, in serving to be to me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary. Captain Phonograph. Give me a moment. Just wanted to make sure I got the right voice. 25th of May. Ebb tide in ap appetite today. Cannot eat. Cannot rest. So diary instead. Since uh, my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems to be su of sufficient importance to be worth it doing. As I kn knew that the only cure for this work or thing was work, I went down amongst the patients. I picked out one who had was I've got an idea about what to do with this voice. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint in his mind to understand him so well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I have ever done, with a view to make my, of making myself master of the facts in his hallucinations, of his in my manner to doing it there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seem to wish to keep him to the point of 
his madness, a thing which I avoid with a patience as I would the mouth of hell. Now, under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Rome Venelia sent. Hell has its price. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards, accurately. So I had better commence to do so, therefore. R. M. Renfield. 59. Sanguine temper Temperament. Great physical strength. Morbidly excitable. Periods of gloom ending in some fixed idea, which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man. Probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armor for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced. When the centripetal f when duty of cause, etc. is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount. And only accident or a ser series of accidents can balance it. Letter when C. P. Morris to home. Arthur Homewood. So it's it's. In other words, my dear Art, we've told yawns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marxis, and drunk hills on the shore of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and other health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one another, one other. Our, di our old pal at the Korea Jack Sewer. He's coming too. And we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup, and to drink a health, and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made, and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting, and a health as true as your own right hand. We both shall swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come, yours as ever, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Homeward to Quincy P. Morris. 26th of May. Count me in every time I bear messages that will make both your ears tingle. Odd. Chapter 6. Mina Murray's journey. 24th of July. Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent, in which they have rooms. This is a lovely pl place, the little river the Esk runs. Through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour, a great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautiful green, beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on I the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see it, see down. The houses of the old towns, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up on one another. The other, anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg, right over the town, is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, 
in which is the scene of part of Mamarian, which the girl was built up in the well. It is a most no noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is the church, the parish one, round where, which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is, to my mind, the nicest spot in Wimpy, for it lies right over the town, and has a full view of the harbour, and all up the bay, to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour that part of the bank has fallen away, and some of the st graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the steady paths pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit there very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with on, with, on the far side, one long granite wall, stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is this lighthouse. A heavy sea wall r runs along outside on it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end, too, has a lighthouse between the two piers, there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the esk, running between banks of, of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side there rises for about a half a, half a mile a great reef, the sharp edges of which run straight out from beneath the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a boyo with a bell, which swings in bad weather and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a runny old man. He must be awfully old for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred and that there, that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very skeptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the late white lady at the abbey, he said very briskly, I wouldn't fear... <coughs> I don't fish fast myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I, I, I don't say that they never was. But I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like. But not for a young lady like you. From feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating curd, herrings, and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet wood creed out. I wonder myself who'd be bothered telling lies to them, even the newspaper which is full of full talk. I thought he would be a good person to learn from, interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just set setting himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he labored to get up and said, I must get, I must gang a gr green onwards home now, miss me granddaughter. 
doesn't like to be kept waiting. When the tea is ready, for it takes me time to cramp by a bone that grease, for there be a many o em and mish. I lack belly timber, sherry by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurling as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature of the place. They lead from the town up to the church. There are hundreds of them. I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have been, have hit, had something to do with the abbey. I shall go home, I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this first first of August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the sir oracle of them, and I should think must have been in the, his time a most dictational person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was always Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful color since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with the will people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradate her. gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it down. It be all full talk, lock, stock, and barrel. That's where it be. Uh, now it else, those bonds and wefts, and bogarts, and bogus, and bogos, and all amid them is only fit to set bounce and daisy women a belt well to. They be not bad air bubbles, air blebs. They in all grims and signs and warnings be all inverted by persons in isam bacrates and railway trotters to see to, to scare and schooner half feelings and to get folks to do something that they will not are inclined to. It make me a feral to think o oh, them. Why it's them that not content with pattern lives on paper and preaching on at own patterns does not to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here all around you in what I give will. All them stains holding up their heads as well as they can up of the pride is a cut simply tumbling down with the weight o' the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body o'er sacred to the memory wrote on them all them are ya ill nigh half o' them there beat no body at all and the memories o' them beat care a pinch o' snuff about much less sacred lies all of, of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, but it'll be a queer squirmed at the day of judgment when they come at Thumbelan. Up in the duck shop, I'll start to get there and try and drag the tomb stains with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trembling and dithering with their hands that dozed and slippery from lying in the sea, and that they cannot, can't even keep their grip over them. I could see from the old fellow's old satisfied hair and the 
way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swalls, you can't be serious. Surely th those tombstones are not all wrong. Yeah, blends, there may be. A parish few not wrong. Seven where to they make art the people to good. For there be folk that do not think a bomb blow. Be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here a stranger and you see this girl. Yep. I nodded for I thought it didn't it better to assent. Though I did not quite understand his dialect, I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on. And you consider it that all these stins be a boon folk that be happened here, snarled and stalk. I assented again. Then that be just... And that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these. They bets that be tomb as old done spuck a box. Friday night, he nudged on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. And my God, how could that be authorized? Look at that other, that one, the afterist abaf and Berbeck. Read it. I went over and read. Edward Slint Slag, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April, 1854, at 30. When I came back, Mr. Saurus went on. Oh, but him home, I wonder, to have him up here. Murder off the coast of Andres, and you constant his party lay under. Why, I could name... Ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above. He pointed northward. Or where the currents may have drifted them. There be the sterns around ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lore. I know his father lost in the live league of Greenland in Schwante. Or Andrew Woodhouse. Drowned in the same seas in 1777. Or John Puxton, drowned off Cape Fear with. A year later, or old Ron Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in 50. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to it be when the trumpet sounds? I have me enthusiasms about it. I tell ye that when they got here, they'd be jumbling and jostling one another. That way that it would be like a fight up on the ice in the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, and trying to tie up our cuts by the light of the aurora borealis. No, you cannot see it. Uh, this be evidently local pleasantry, for the old man crackled over it, and his cronies joined in with a gusto. But, but, surely you are not quite correct, for you would start on the assumption that all the poor people or their spirits will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that would be necessary? Really necessary? Well, what else be that tombstone for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose? This he said with intense scorn. How will it please your their relatives to know what lies and wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a, at a slab, on which the seat was rested close to the edge of the cliff. 
Read the lies on that tufta stin. He said, the letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them. So she leaned over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection on July 29th, 1873, falling from the rocks at Kettleston, Kettleness. This tomb is erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and was real, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. S really, Mr. Swaltz, I don't see anything very funny in that. She sp spoke. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see a funny. But that's because he don't come the Sarwin mother was a hillcock that hated him because he was a screwed a regular limiter. He was un he hated her so that he committed suicide in order to, that she might get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that they had for scaring the crowds with that. Short for crows, then, for it brought the clegs and the tops to him. That's the way he fell off from the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection, I've often heard him say, Massel, that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that stern at any rate? He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack of lies, and won't it make Gabriel keckle when Gadre comes patting up the graves with the tomb stand, balanced on his hump, and ask it to be took as evidence. I do not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up. Oh, why did you tell me tell us of this? It is my favorite seat, and I am, and I cannot leave it. And now I find it, I must go on sitting over the, the grave of a suicide? That won't harm ye, my pretty, and it may make poor Gurdji glad some to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, I've sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't ye fash about them, as lies under ye, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for ye to get be getting scared when ye see the Tom Stanians. Tom Stains, I'll run away with him, and the place as bare as a stubble field. There the clock, and I must gang. May service to a, may ye ladies. And off he wobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat. And she told me all about all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage that made me just a little heartsick for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day I came up here alone for I am very sad. There was no letter from me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town. Welcome back, Pepper. Sometimes in rows, where the streets are, and sometimes singly, they run right up the esk and die away in the curves of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a gl clatter of a donkey's hoofs up the paved road below. The band of the pier is... In good time, and further along the quay, 
there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hear the other, but up here I hear. Up here I, up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Doctor Seward's diary. Fifth of June. The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed. Selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seemed to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know yet. I do not yet know. It is I who... Do not yet know. His redeeming qualities is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in them, that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to exposure it, to my astonishment. He did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment, and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, that would do. I must watch them. 18th of June. He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He ha keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished. Although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside his room to his room. First of July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He'd cheerfully acquisitioned in this and I gave him the same time, as before for reduction. He disgusted me, much while he with him. For when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held in an exultanity for a few moments, between his finger and thumb, before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued, quietly, that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, and then the totals added in batches again, as though he were focusing. Some account, as the auditors put it. 8th of July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea of it, rudimentary idea, in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon. And then, oh, unconscious celebration. You will have to give the walls to your un your conscious brother. 
I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any changes. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partly named tamed it. His means of taming is simple, simple. For already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19th of July. We are progressing, my friend, has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor. A very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, A kitten. A nice kitten. Sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach, and feed, and uh, feed, and, and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on, increasing in size and capacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and the spiders, so I said I would see about it and asked him if he would not rather have a cat. We'll be right back, commercial break, and then hopefully we can finish this in the next 28 minutes or so. Because I still have to worry about download size for Twitch. Then a kitten. 
His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh, oh yes, I would like a cat. I only ask you for a kitten, uh, lest you shouldn't refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten. What are they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it. Whereupon he went without a word and sat down, gnawing his fat fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning early. 20th of, June, of July Visited Renfield yes, very early, before the attendants went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully. And with a good grace, I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied without turning round that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room and on his pillow. A drop of blood, I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there were anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant had just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief, my belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds, and that he just took and ate them raw. I g 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make him even him sleep, and took him away his, took away his pocket book to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a particular kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagus. Life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would have almost be worth while to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect? The knowledge of the brain. Had I even the secret of one? Such mind. Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanders' physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were sufficient cause, 
I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me. For may not I, too, be of an exceptional brain, congenially. How well the man-reasoned lunatics always do with their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one he has closed the account most accurately, and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my old life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums up me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I only could have as strong a cause of, as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work that would be indeed happiness. Mina Maria's journal. 26th of July. I am anxious and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also soothing something about the shorthand symbols that make it different from writing. I'm unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned. But yesterday, dear Hawkins, who is always so kind sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said that enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, always, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of waking of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Miss Westerner has gone and I got an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place, poor dear. She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Homewood, he is the Hon, Arthur Homewood, only son of Lord Godalming, Godalming is, close, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat on the churchyard cliff, and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when she, when he arrives. 27th of June, July. But no news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should... I do not know, but I do wish that he would write. If it were only a single line, Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by him while moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold, but still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am great for getting myself and wake for myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Homewood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. 
Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her. Lux, she is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely ro rose pink. She has lost that Enikman look which she had. I pray it will at last. 3rd of August, another week gone, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Harkin, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her, which I do not understand. There is, even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tried the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room, searching for the key. 6th of August. Another three days of no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but it is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are uh, in, a, in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a grey day, and the sun, it, as I write, is hidden in thick clouds. High over kettleness, everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Ray as a rock, ray clouds, tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand points stretch into grey fingers. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows, and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mist. Drifting island, the horizon is lost in a grey mist, all is vastness, the clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brew over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and di dip in the ground, swell as they sweep into the harbor, bending to the scoopers here comes old Mr. S Swalls. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and asked him to speak fully, so he said, leaving his hand in mine, I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead, and such like for past week, but I didn't mean them, and I want ye to remember that when I'm gone, we we odd folks we had folks that be daft, daffled, and with one foot abaft the crock hoil don't altogether th like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scart as of it, and that's why I took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But Lord love ye, miss, I ain't afraid of dying not a bit, only I don't want to die if I can't help it. My time must be nigh at hand now. For I be odd, and I hundred years is too much for any man to expect, and I'm so nigh it that the odd man is already within his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin about it all at once. The chaffs will wag as they be used to, some day soon. The angel of death will sound his trumpet for me.
but don't ye dole and greet me dairy, dairy, for he saw that I was, for he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waiting for something else that, than what we're all doing, and death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content for me. It's coming to me, me dearie, and coming quick. It may be coming a while we look in and wonder in. Maybe it's in that wind up over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look. He cried. He cried. So, suddenly, there's something in that wind and in the host beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like it. It's in the air. I feel it's coming. Lord, make me answer cheerful when me call comes. He, he held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me with, and said goodbye, and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look there again. She is steering mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. Chapter 7 Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August Posted in Mina Murray's journal From a correspondent, Whitby, one of the greatest and suddenest storms on record, has been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the greatest body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rig Mill, Brunswick, Strathius, and the various trips in the neighborhood of Whitby. The st steamers... Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping, both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from that commanding eminence watched the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails. High in the sky to the northwest, the wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which in barometric language ranked number two, light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century had kept watch on weather signs from the eastern cliff, East Cliff, foretold in an epithetic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly colored clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old courtyard to enjoy the beauty before the sun dipped below the mass black mass of kettleness, standing boldly athwart this western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds, every sunset color, flame, purple, pink, 
green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness and all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketchers of the prelude to the great storm will grace the R, A, and R, I, walls in May. Next, move more than one captain made up his mind. Then and there, that his cobble and his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which on the approach of thunder affects persons of a sensible, sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting streamers, which usually hug the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner, schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westward. The full-heartedness of ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. But the night shut down. She was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the under adulting swell of the seas. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean, shortly before ten o'clock the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleeding of a ship inland or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctively heard, and the band on the pier with its lively fresh air French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange faint hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke with a rapidly rapidity, which at the time seemed incredible. And even afterward, it's impossible to realize the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The wave rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow. All right, so we're going to go ahead and call it there. So, for the record, um, I wasn't planning on finishing this book today. Um, I was planning on getting to page 100, uh, 608, which we got to page 100, 6, 618. Um, I divided it into four parts. No, five parts. Uh, it is a 3,038-page reading yeah um so that'll be what we divide what we go through in the mondays throughout october for right now just like to go ahead and say thank you for watching have a great night stay safe and i look forward to seeing you all on tomorrow tuesday where we'll be playing another spooky game. In the meantime, let's go ahead and find someone to read off to. In fact, Pepper, you're here. Why don't you choose someone if you want to? Pepper, you there? Okay. 
All right, I can choose. All right. pain in the neck that's not just the expression i'm actually like playing i overstretched some muscles but um which i don't know Give me one moment. I don't know why my computer was getting overheated. Um, we're going to go ahead and raid off to uh, Rev. Please give Rev some love and support. I'll see you all on tomorrow, Tuesday. Later.